Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come in again in glory. As in baptism, Susan Coates put on Christ. So in Christ, may Susan be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are children of God. Here we shall be and see what has not yet been revealed. But we know that when Christ appears that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and earth. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we have gathered here today to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate, let me say that word again, as we celebrate the beautiful life of Susan Coates. We come together in grief, and yet we acknowledge our human loss. May God grant us all peace, that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, in death, resurrection. Would you please bow with me as I pray? O oh God who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace, that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, my name is Pastor Lori Spangler. I have the privilege of standing before you today and honoring and remembering the beautiful life of Miss Susan Coates. As a former pastor here at St. Paul's, I was privileged to know her and her family. So when I say it's an honor to be asked to come, it truly is an honor. As I told her family earlier, I like weddings, don't get me wrong, but people have a tendency to like to get married more than once. Yeah, some more than twice, uh, but you die once and it should be beautiful and sacred. It should be honorable. It should be a holy time of remembering the beautiful life that we have lost, but all that heaven has gained. And so when I say we celebrate as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we celebrate that even though Susan is not here on this earth, she has received the greatest of rewards. So I encourage you as we gather in a few moments to lift our voices and sing uh, hymns, as we reflect on prayers and stories and scriptures, may you find that beautiful remembrance. Reflect upon it. Celebrate. So that when you leave, you do not leave with a sense of sadness, but one like Susan that reflects joy. A joy everlasting. So thank you for allowing me to be here Thank you for coming and being with the family, understanding their loss, supporting them with your prayers and your presence and the food that I know that they have received. Thank you on behalf of the Coates family. And may we all now stand together and let us lift our voices as we sing. I sing a song of the saints of God. I believe it may be on the screen. If not, it's found on page 712 in your hymnal. If you'll stand and join with me.
you would please remain standing for the Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith. It's found in your bulletin. If you'll join me and lift our voices together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated, please. I would now like to offer you comfort from the reading of the Holy Scriptures, beginning with Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Continuing with select verses from John chapter 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. Because I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace. Peace I give to you. My peace I give. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. In closing, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the city of Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the, from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning and crying, and there will be no pain, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this. For these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water. To those who conquer will inherit these things. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, I would have liked to invite Ms. Susan Schindel to come and share a few words with us.
Well, my name is Susan Yarbrough Schindel, and it is my honor to be here today to help you celebrate the life of our dear friend, Susan Elaine Featherston Coates. Simply put, Susan was, all the days of her life, a truly loyal wife, mother, and friend. My friendship with Susan began 50 years ago. In the fall of 1972, I was just out of graduate school, new to Monroe, and ready to make some new friends. I don't remember now how I found the Pi Beta Phi alum club meeting that day, but I walked into Lynn Hodge's house one morning without knowing a single solitary soul. By the time I left, I had made the acquaintance of a vivacious, spirited redhead who shared my Arkansas roots, my love of Pi Beta Phi, my passion for the Arkansas Razorbacks, and even my college alma mater of Memphis State University. What are the chances? I did not know it then, but Susan Featherston was going to add me to her special collection of friends for life. Because believe me, if you were Susan's friend, she was never going to lose track of you, and she was never going to let you go, no matter what. Not long after I met Susan, she attended a backyard hamburger party here in Monroe. Susan never passed up an opportunity for a good hamburger. But to her surprise, that night, she also met the love of her life, Ed Coates. Ed, who was not exactly known to be a quick mover, apparently knew, <laughs> apparently knew that he had found a gem because six short months later, he popped the big question. And they were married at Parkview Baptist Church in October of 1975. They were a perfect match in temperament and common interests. My favorite story, or one of my favorite stories, concerns a weekday ritual that they shared for years. Their closest friends knew never to call their house or to extend an invitation that was going to take place between 4.30 and 5 o'clock p.m. Monday through Friday. For that call would go unanswered, and those invitations would be declined. For that sacred time was the best part of their day when just the two of them gathered in front of the television set to watch their favorite show, Jeopardy, with Alex Trebek. And Susan and Ed loved traveling together all over the country. Susan Lowry reminded me recently about a trip that they planned to Napa Valley a few years ago. The day before they left, a huge hailstorm hit Monroe. But the next day, the airport was open. And after much discussion, they could not find a legitimate reason to cancel that trip. By the time they did arrive in Napa, Monroe had been overwhelmed by a huge flood. They discussed it again, but still could not come up with a compelling reason to cut the trip short. So they stayed in Napa, drank a lot of good wine, enjoyed the scenery and each other, and had an overall fabulous time together, one of many great trips they took. Susan and Ed even had a competition with Randy and Kathy Hall to see who could visit the most presidential libraries. Not sure where that count stands between them, but I do remember that Susan was obsessed with Ronald and Nancy Reagan, reading dozens of books about their lives over the years. So it's no surprise to learn that the Reagan Library in Simi, Cal uh, Simi Valley, California was her absolute favorite. A game changer in Ed and Susan's lives came with the birth of their daughter, Catherine, in 1977. And later in 1980 with the birth of son, Cortland. Once the children came along, Susan realized that the job she most loved was being a stay-at-home mom, which is really the hardest job of all. 
and she did what good mothers do. She showed up faithfully for every important event in their lives. Growing up in Mark Tree, Arkansas, Susan had developed a love of sports, which she shared with her father. So it came naturally for her to genuinely look forward to and to show up for Portland's t-ball, football, and soccer games, all the way from preschool, which I remember, through high school. She lived and died on those days, depending on whether the games were won or lost. Catherine shared with me how faithfully Susan showed up for her for art lessons, recitals, and plays. For everything, and even after she enrolled at SMU, they traveled regular, regularly to Dallas to get to know her friends well, to participate in and to be a part of her new life there. Later, Susan loved helping Catherine plan her beautiful wedding in this very church to Cameron White. Her affection for Cameron extended naturally to his parents, Ray and Terry, and grew even deeper when they were all blessed with two precious grandchildren, William and Caroline. If truth be told, Susan was more than a little miffed that both grandchildren had the audacity to arrive a week before their due date so that Susan missed being in the hospital to greet them on day one. But she and Ed, never ones to be deterred by long distances, showed up in Atlanta as quickly as they could, spending a full week after each birth to help with the babies and the household chores. But Susan's focus extended far beyond her family to this huge circle of friends from Arkansas, Louisiana, and all over the United States. She stayed in touch with everyone and was so interested to hear all the news about their lives and the lives of their family. For years, she labored on a Christmas newsletter, which I looked forward to receiving. It was specifically for out-of-town guests, um, out-of-town friends, and happily related the Coates family highlights from the previous year as a way to maintain those family ties. Her birthday luncheon group, the famous birthday luncheon group, consisted of Susan Lowry, Kathy Hall, Ann Cooksey, Judy Marks, and Linda Graves, and was not to be missed under any circumstances. She was so loyal to this group that even after her health began to fail and she was in a wheelchair, she made it to every single birthday celebration. When COVID made in-person gatherings impossible, Susan participated in drive-by celebrations. And in case you missed it the first time, Susan loved her sorority, Pi Beta Phi. In the early 1970s, a small group of Pi Phi newcomers arrived in Monroe. Susan and me, Ann Cooksey, Susan Lowry, and Sammy Salisbury. We tapped into Susan's Pi Beta Phi spirit and pretty much unilaterally decided to raise Pi Phi awareness in Monroe by having an annual fundraiser. The Pi Beta Phi Progressive Luncheon and Home Tour consumed our time for several years. Looking back on this 50-year friendship, I remember lots of fun and lots of stories which I don't have time to share. But I must tell you about her first apartment in Monroe. I want you to imagine, if you will, orange wall-to-wall -wall shag carpet, consistent with 1970s decor. The living room and kitchen had been proudly accessorized by Susan with red Arkansas Razorback clocks and ashtrays. Annetta Hill and I took one look and decided a makeover was definitely in order. Susan could not have cared less, but with that special, precious little twinkle in her eye, she smiled and patiently indulged us. Annetta found a small sewing machine, and we bought color-coordinated floral sheets that were transformed magically 
into what we thought at the time were fabulous curtains to soften the look. I vividly remember some serious negotiations about the Razorback memorabilia, but reluctantly, Susan allowed us to pack away her treasures. The truth is, Susan did not feel that decorating was her thing. But to me, this anecdote suggests something far more profound about Susan Coates. No, she didn't really concern herself with collecting art or antiques or jewelry or cars. She collected friends and family. She tended to her friends and family like some people tend to their gardens. And so her collection grew and blossomed. She watched over the collection and personally and lovingly tended to its needs. Her time and energy was invested in her friends and family members, all of you, because you were what she considered to be important and spending time with you provided the ultimate joy in her life. I would like to leave you with passages from Proverbs 31, passages that to me perfectly reflect Susan's life and legacy. A wife of noble character who can find, for she is worth more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. May God bless this family and our sweet and precious memories of Susan Elaine Featherston Coates. Thank you, Ms. Shindle. Thank you, each of you, for coming here today to celebrate the life of my generous, thoughtful, sweet, beautiful mother. We appreciate all the love and support that you have shown to her and to our family over the years, but especially during the recent hospitalizations in recent months. The prayers, meals, Phone calls, texts, and visits not only lifted my mother, but also kept my dad, Cortland, and I sustained. Words can barely express my gratitude to all of you. Wherever travels took mom and dad, they made an effort to reach out in that city for lunch with friends for a visit. Not only was this true of their friendships, but of mine as well. Over the years, mom and dad became friends with my friends, traveling from Birmingham to Napa for weddings, calling on them when they were visiting their city, and even becoming friends with their parents. Just last October, mom and dad met me in Dallas for SMU homecoming, and they invited two of my best friends, Ann Jane and Kristen, to lunch with us on Sunday after church. While I could have easily reached out to those friends to extend the invitation, mom made it a point to reach out on her own to those friends and make sure they knew she wanted them in attendance. It was not an idea in my view of efficiency. I had not concocted the idea to simultaneously see my parents and friends at the same time. A hallmark of many mothers is their cooking, and my mom was no exception. She made the absolute best tacos, spaghetti with meat sauce, party chicken, <laughs> peach cobbler, pink fluff, and fruit cocktail. 
Whenever I would come to town, she would make sure to serve these meals. I didn't even have to ask her. She just knew what I would want and prepared for my arrival. While she did not have the stamina in the last couple of years to cook, she made sure that my dad had fruit cocktail waiting for me when I came home and that dad had the ingredients to make meals to take to friends who were sick or who had lost loved ones. Even when she wasn't in the best of health, she was always thinking of others. Now it may come as a surprise that my mom was considered the Kool-Aid queen for my group of middle and high school friends. Nell Seegers, a phenomenal cook in her own right, even went so far to go to my parents' house to get a precise lesson in the art of Kool-Aid making. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ms. Seegers was somewhat disappointed when there was no grand reveal of the life-altering secret ingredient during the Kool-Aid lesson. <laughs> As the news spread this past weekend about my mom's passing, I received numerous texts from girlfriends remembering what wonderful Kool-Aid my mom made. <laughs> Katie Williams even reminded me that mom gave her a very special gift during college. A plastic pitcher, a box of Kool-Aid packets, <laughs> and a wooden spoon to make her own Kool-Aid <laughs> in her very first apartment. Sadly, to this day, we have not solved the enigma of what made Susan Coates' Kool-Aid the best on the block. Whether the water is just different at 2223 Pargood Boulevard, or whether my mom had a special flick of her wrist during the stirring to add that special touch, I guess some mysteries will just have to remain. As a busy working mom with young kids, my mom also came to my rescue several times to be my personal shopper. One such occasion was when I was 34 weeks pregnant, too tired to waddle myself in 90 plus degree heat to Lenox Mall to find shoes for my role as matron of honor in a Napa Valley wedding. I dialed up my trusty mother, ever ready for the shopping challenge, and presented her with my wardrobe predicament. She tapped into her network at her favorite Monroe stores and soon had a package in the mail with just the right pair of shoes, which I still have to this day. Now who in the audience is going to help fill this role for me now? I'm taking applications via text after this service. <laughs> so just be prepared if you apply to, for this role to take some uh, wardrobe predicaments coming in hot from Atlanta and needing a quick turnaround. <laughs> Mom and I have forever shared a passion and infatuation with the Today Show. Truth be told, we're really more interested in the lifestyle stories and the anchors themselves than we are the hard news. We love their fashion, the banter between the segments, Jenna Bush Hager's monthly book club reveals, and the little hint that anchors frequently make about their own personal lives. Once I relocated to the Eastern time zone 20 years ago, I proclaimed myself the East Coast correspondent. If something really interesting happens during the Today Show in my time zone, I call my parents and give them a one hour heads up so they know when to be in front of the TV. If you're a Today Show junkie like me and mom, let me know, and I'll be glad to add you to my very reliable alert system. <laughs> I will miss giving my mom these morning calls and discussing some of our favorite stories from the week during our weekly Sunday night chats. Speaking of our Sunday night phone chats, this sacred tradition originated when I went off to college. We couldn't chat on Sunday afternoon because mom was already preoccupied talking to her parents. But we could talk on Sunday evening while long distance was still cheap. Does anyone remember paying for long distance? <laughs> mom and dad would both get on the phone and we'd discuss the happenings from the previous week 
and then what was planned for the week ahead. When Cameron and I had children, the focus of the call shifted to what our kids were doing and what funny stories there were about them. Her joy truly came from her grandchildren's joy. Calls have been as short as 30 minutes when I could barely keep my eyes open with young children to nearly two and a half hours when we were planning mine and Cameron's wedding. I'm grateful that there were no long distance charges at that time. <laughs> but no matter the length of the call, we couldn't adjourn until my mom had full updates on the life and times of my closest friends. My mom's unique memory to remember the details of each life was part of what made her so special. There's something though that's very unexpected about my mother and that can't go unmentioned. Most people wouldn't believe that a five foot short petite woman with a five size, size five shoe would be the strongest person they've ever known. But I have learned that strength can come in all shapes and sizes. And mom's inner strength and resolve during her battle with rheumatoid arthritis is to be revered. I told mom in several Mother's Day cards over the years that she truly has been the strongest person I've ever, ever known. In the 30 years that she battled with rheumatoid, she lived with pain every single day and had to take copious medications just to make it through. And she always did so without complaining. Many people didn't know that she suffered from this invisible disease because she kept doing, she kept trying, she kept dreaming, and she kept a smile on her face. She persevered in the face of adversity day after day and setback after setback. There are many types of these invisible diseases out there. So please be kind to and patient with each other. You just never know what someone else may be battling or how much effort it took them to do something. Mom's spirit during her battle reminds me of Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you may go. The American spiritual leader and author from the 1960s and 1970s, Ram Das, has a quote that I cherish. He says, we're all just walking each other home. Dad, you especially did an exemplary job of helping walk mom home to Jesus. Thank you for continuously being by her side in both sickness and in health. Mom, I can't thank you enough for all the love you poured into me and eventually into my husband and children while here on earth. I will carry your heart with me and our fond memories together for the rest of my days. You're no longer just a pie fi angel, but a heavenly one. You've certainly earned those wings. Now go soar high in your new heavenly estate. And please send us some signs that you're watching over us. We'll love you forever. Part of the reason that I enjoy, I'm not sure that that's an appropriate word, but it is. It's something I enjoy with funerals is coming and gaining so much from someone. Was there something in, in Miss Susan's story or in Catherine's story that, that perhaps you thought, man, I need to be more like that? Because that's what we hopefully gain. You know, we, we lose, but we also gain in these moments. We gain inspiration. We gain hope. And I see that in the stories that you shared. They were beautiful. So thank you so very much. I'm going to take a different approach. And I love that they were able to share their personal stories. 
And now I'm going to look at the scriptures and I want to see if you, like I, see Miss Susan and the fruit of the Spirit. That's where I'm going to look this afternoon. Because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is the result of the Holy Spirit's presence in the life of a Christian. One of the primary purposes of the Holy Spirit coming into a Christian's life is to change that life. It is the Holy Spirit's job to conform us to the image of Christ, making us more like Him. Galatians 5, 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We are here today to celebrate the life of Miss Susan Coates. And I want to use this time to share with you how she has modeled the fruit of the Spirit. We saw it so much in the stories that were just told to us. But let me begin with love. The love which the Holy Spirit manifests in believers is an agape love. Now this love is not a feeling, but it is a choice. It is a choice to be kind, to make sacrifices, to consider another's needs greater than one's own. Mark 20, excuse me, Mark 12, 30 through 31 reminds us to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. We heard earlier the many ways that Miss Susan knew how to love. Let me repeat that. She knew how to love. She knew how to love and she knew how to be loved by her family and her friends and by her Lord. She especially knew the love of her husband of 46 years, Dr. Ed. She loved her role as a mother to Catherine and Cortland. I love the stories of being a stay-at-home mom and volunteering and making all the efforts to be there because I've been on the side of that. And let me tell you, if you haven't, and some of you have, it is hard. It's not an easy job. It's one of the hardest jobs, but it's the most rewarding. And I can see Susan doing this with a smile on her face and with joy that just is unspeakable. She was PTO president and room parent. She was there cheering on her children in the ups and downs of life, whether it's sporting events and pep rallies or just the growing pains that come with parenting children. But Susan really relished and loved her role as Mimi to William and Caroline. But what we don't realize, as Catherine said, that there were these unspeakable moments in her life these hidden moments that, that other eyes may not have seen. There was moments where there was struggle, where there was true effort in making all of those things work and come together. But you know what? She did it. She did it with joy and grace and dignity. Even if there were moments that were physically hard for her, even at a younger age, she still showed up and she loved. She loved richly and deeply because that is who she was. Now joy is another fruit, and it's the natural reaction to this work of God. Joy is being content no matter the circumstances. Happiness is dependent upon our circumstances. So when you say you're happy, that's dependent upon your circumstances. But to be joyful, to know joy, that's a different story. That takes a lot of strength a lot of effort, a lot of understanding. The first time I visited Dr. Ed and Miss Susan in their home, I was greeted by this smile that just radiated joy. It was all over her face. It's almost as if it was uh, this aura that just trickled out into the room. And on this particular day, she had mentioned that she had not uh, been feeling 100%. But, you know, she never went on and on about that. It was not, woe is me. It was not a depressing tale. But instead, she was upbeat, positive, joyful. Perhaps it was, it's because she truly understood, truly understood, that this life is temporary. And her security, her joy, was a result of her own security and her salvation. You know, ultimately, she knew where she would spend eternity. Our greatest reason as believers to be joyful is because God wants to save us and spend eternity with us. That is what makes us joyful, not just happy, but joyful. 
so that no matter what this world throws at us, because we live in a fallen world, it's often difficult to truly be happy and find joy. But with fellowship with God, our joy is complete. And not only does our fellowship with God bring us joy, but it brings us peace. And God's peace transcends all of these earthly matters. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 illustrates that believers are to be anxious for nothing, for God promises to guard our hearts and minds. It is a peace which transcends all understanding today, tomorrow, and all the days to come. I pray that the peace of God will carry each of you. It'll carry you in the same way that it carried your mother. That same peace that brought comfort to Susan on even her most difficult of days is what will bring you peace as well. Now this fruit I find a little more challenging, and that's patience. Anybody else here find that one difficult? We can skip right over that one, huh? I'll just throw that one out. But patience in Galatians 5.22 literally means long temper. And the sense of the ability to hold one's temper for a long time. Now I have a little color on my hair right now. This is not usually what my hair looks like. I went a little bit bolder and braver. But I do have some, uh, some red roots in there. And if I'm honest... With red hair comes what? Anybody know? <laughs> a little bit of a red-headed temper. I'm sure I'm much better now than I was in my 20s. But, but that old red-headed temper, you know, it has a tendency to flare up. You know, Miss Susan was a beautiful redhead, but I don't ever recall anyone mentioning her temper. The King James Version translates it long-suffering. A patient person is able to endure much pain and suffering with out complaining. So it is, since it is a fruit of the Spirit, we can only possess this kind of patience through the power and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I think Miss Susan was the King James Version. Long-suffering. Knowing how to be patient, faithful, loving, and joyful all while enduring a pain not always visible to others. And God also showed us kindness through the giving of his son. And through the life of Christ, we see the kindness of God lived out through Jesus' ministry, life, and death. When we exhibit the fruit of kindness, we are reflecting the image of Christ. We are tender, benevolent, and useful to others. Every action, every word will have a flavor of grace in it. Does that sound familiar? That sounds like a Susan that we know. That is why kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And if kindness is a fruit of the Spirit, then surely goodness is its sister. Goodness is virtue and holiness in action. It results in a life characterized by deeds motivated by righteousness and a desire to be a blessing. It's a moral characteristic of a Spirit-filled person. Susan attended the University of Memphis for her undergraduate studies in English, and she was very active on campus during um, college. And as we heard earlier, she loved her Pi Beta Phi sorority. She enjoyed attending meetings, but also she loved writing letters of recommendation. When my daughter was going to college and we first moved here to Monroe, we didn't know very many people, but I remember Miss Susan saying, I'll write a letter. And I remember thinking, that's so sweet. You don't even know us. That's so sweet. But she loved doing that. She did it for dozens of Monroe um, High School graduates. It was even people she didn't know, like myself and my daughter. She did it because of the kindness and the goodness that I mentioned. She didn't expect or want anything in return. I'm sure she only wanted the girls to have the same positive and fun experiences that she had. A better example of that goodness and kindness might be a story that Catherine shared with me. It's a beautiful story. You see, Susan wanted to attend the service at Grace, and it was the night before Thanksgiving. And one of the things that they requested for attendance was to just bring a canned item, a canned food um, donation. 
And even though it would have been much easier for her to send someone else to ask Catherine, you go get it and, and get, just grab something and we'll go. That's not what Susan wanted. Instead, she insisted on going herself. And with Susan in tow, she donned her walker. And up and down the aisles of the grocery store she went. Even though it was a struggle, even though it was very hard for her to, to do those things, she was insistent. But she didn't just grab the first thing on the shelf, but she was intentional in the way she looked at each and every item, picking just what she wanted to bring with her. I can just see her going up and down the aisles, making careful selections. She suffered from rheumatoid arthritis for over 30 years, and yet she didn't let it stop her from doing good. I'm sure faithfulness played a role. Faithfulness, that fruit that allows us to believe that God is who he says he is. This faithfulness that continues to, to help us believe despite the challenges of this life. We trust he will work everything out for good. We trust that he will work his will in us. Even when she was unable to attend church here at St. Paul's, Susan would faithfully watch online and then she would watch Catherine's former church in Dallas and then her current church in Atlanta. And she was getting more church than some of you do in a month, so I just want to throw that out there. But you see, her faith was important to her. She understood faithfulness because she saw that her God was faithful. Our final fruit is gentleness. It can be also translated as meekness, but don't mistake it for weakness. Because as Catherine said, she may have only been five foot tall, but she was not weak. Rather, this kind of gentleness involves humility and thankfulness toward God and this polite, restrained behavior toward others. She was strong. She endured what others may not have been able to endure. She persevered when it would have been easier to give up and give in. She was fiercely loyal unbelievably kind and she loved boldly and beautifully perhaps these last two readings can sum up the life of our dear sister in christ miss susan philippians 4 8 says finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Philippians 4.8 is a guideline for continual growth and transformation in the life of a Christian. Refusing to dwell on negativity and intentionally focusing on the positivity are ingredients that God uses to allow peace to grow and turmoil to dwindle. I believe Susan did all of these things. And she would encourage us to do the same. I also think that she would want me to leave you with these last words from John Wesley. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, and all the ways you can, and all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. I thank God for the life and the legacy of Miss Susan Coates. Amen. And now I would like to invite you to stand as together we sing Hymn of Promise found on page 707.
friends, I wish I could tell you that this life would be without hardship, that it would all be butterfly and rainbows, but I can't because that's what awaits us, an eternal home full of glory and love where there is no more sorrow and pain, no more death and dying. But until we get to the other side of heaven, let us live as those who understand the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us, those fruit of the Spirit. And let us go forward as our friend Susan, living kindly, being generous and compassionate to all in this world. As Catherine alluded, we never know which battle one another faces, what battles we secretly fight. So go be kind. Go be kind and loving in honor and memory of your friend. Let us all strive to do better and be better with the time we have. Receive these words as a benediction. God of us all, your love never ends. When all else fails, you still are God. We pray to you for one another in our need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. To those who doubt, give light. To those who are weak, strength. To all who have sinned, mercy. To all who sorrow, your peace. Keep true in us the love which will hold one another. In our ways, we trust you. And to you, with your church on earth and in heaven, we offer honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen.